So I've been working on ecstasy for more years than I care to think of. It's getting over 20, 25 years now. Um, so I'm going to do, give a sort of history of the sorts of research I've been doing and other people as well o over this period. So it was first introduced really in the mid-1980s and then it became very popular and so it really increased its use in the 1990s and then it seemed to peak around about 2000 and then in the 2000s it seemed to decrease in popularity um, and cocaine took over and now cocaine as we saw in one of the earlier speak talks is now more popular worldwide than cocaine in, in international terms. As we also saw in some earlier slides, recently we've had some higher dose MDMA. And this has mainly come out of Holland, Belgium, those sorts of countries which have got big MDMA factories. They tend to produce very high quality MDMA. The EMC DDA had a big closure of one of these factories around about 2012. And the strength of the tablets they found and the purity was very high. It was 100% purity. The, the, the stuff was very good quality. And so people these days are getting quite high strength um, MGMA, and this is corresponding with an increase in death rates. When the higher strength stuff came to the UK, one of my colleagues, Fabrizio Scafano, emailed me and he said, we're, we're getting a peak in deaths in the UK. It was then about 60 a year. It had been 10 to 20 earlier. So this corresponded with the increase in purity. The other thing is that when I started, MDMA users were a very pure group, they were very e evangelical, they took it, they didn't take other drugs. These days, that's, we don't find that at all. Everyone we see who takes MDMA are polydrug users, which makes research more, more complex. We've got n novel drugs, which again we've mentioned, methadrone or MCAT, and um, we've been lo looking at this more and more in, in Swansea. But one thing I'd like to emphasize, because I give talks at lots of drugs conferences, where everyone seems to think that everyone's on drugs. Most people aren't on drugs. Most young people aren't on drugs. The, the rate of usage, 1% to 2%, means that 98%, 97% of young people aren't taking these drugs. So I'd like to emphasize that, that it is very much a, a minority activity. We've seen already that MDMA is a methamphetamine drug, and in fact its closest similarity is to the parent compound, meth methamphetamine. So it has many of the properties of a standard CNS stimulant, as we, as we heard in the previous slide. So I liked your slide of the body and all the organs affected by methamphetamine. In fact, you could almost replicate that, not totally, but a lot of replication would be for MDMA. MDMA also adversely affects the liver, the heart, the circulation, the lungs, breathing is affected, etc. So MDMA affects lots of normal bodily functions. The key thing about MDMA, however, is its effects upon serotonin, or 5-HT, and it reverses the serotonin transporter. So when you take MDMA, unlike methamphetamine, you get this nice boost in serotonin, and that gives it a slightly different profile from methamphetamine. It's a very messy drug. It affects nearly all your neurotransmitters. So if you do brain imaging, and you look at the brain, particularly the novice person that's taken MDMA the first time, the brain is lit up. Dopamine is increased, noradrenaline, 5-HT, other key neurotransmitters all lit up. So it has very messy effects upon all your neurotransmitter systems, not, not just acetylcholine. So a key question is, is ecstasy MDMA? This has always been um, a, an issue, and I've been to so many conferences where people say, well, people take ecstasy, it has no MDMA in it. So I, I did the review in 2004 looking at this, and interestingly, the first papers published in the 1980s said it was for the drug of high street purity. These are studies done in America. So in the mid-1980s, MDMA was very pure. It was purer than the other street drugs then available. This carried on to the early 1990s, when it was still a drug of high purity. Then we had some massive police seizures of the saffron 
chemicals used as precursors, you had increasing demand from young people, and the late 1990s were a period of decreasing purity. The drug dealers were selling anything they could to get money from people, as the MDMA supplies were, were getting difficult. Then we had high purity again around about 2000, so about four or five years we had high rates of purity. When I wrote my paper, I stated that the 2000s were a period of high purity, but luckily at the end of that paper I said, but we don't know the future. That was quite prescient, because in the late 2000s, 2005, 2010, again we had a drop in purity. But since then, as I've mentioned already, it's now increased in purity again. So now it tends to be a drug of quite high purity and high strength as well. But who can tell? We can't tell the future. It might drop again fairly soon. One of the key factors about MDMA is chronic tolerance. And this is the loss of efficacy as you take the drug repeatedly. And this is a key factor for MDMA, which you get far more strongly with than the other amphetamines. We saw a slide earlier saying that people go to addiction clinics for problems of amphetamine, methamphetamine, but not with MDMA. The reason for this is MDMA damages the serotonin system. So the more you take it, the more you have to take to get an effect, the less of an effect you have, this is chronic tolerance and you end up stopping taking it because it no longer has an effect. Therefore, you're not going to addiction centers. You can't develop dependency on MDMA because it's damaging the serotonin system of the brain. If it didn't damage that, you might get dependence. But because you don't get that, the MDMA users tend to stop taking it. So nearly every study has reported chronic tolerance. So the novice users take half a tablet or one tablet. Then after a few months, they move to one and two tablets. Three months, six months later, three or four tablets. If they carry on taking it, if they've used it for three or four years, they'll take four or five tablets. In some of our studies, we've had people take an average of six tablets. That's a range from about three to nine. So moderate users always take more than one, and they can be up to nine or ten. The most we've come across is 25 tablets in one evening. And then that person said it still didn't have much of an effect. And um, there have been lots of studies showing that really heavy chronic users, people like suppliers who are taking their own supplies, they can take vast amounts of MDMA and not suffer much effects from it, primarily because it's damaged the serotonin system and the other neurochemical systems in the brain. So, it just damages the brain without leading to dependence. Recently, we've done a study in, in Swansea where we found lots of very heavy users who've been using a number of years, and over half of those were injecting MDMA. They tended to find MDMA injection wasn't very good for them. It had such strong, rapid effects, and also strong, rapid come-down effects, they often went back to taking it um, orally or snorting it. But, but it certainly does occur, particularly in the very heavy users. So MGMA affects lots of brain regions, including the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is in, involved in thermal control. So you need a good functioning brain to know when you're hot, when you're cold, and for the body to heat up when you're cool, to cool yourself down when you're hot. MDMA damages this region, and in most temperatures, a normal room temperature will tend to overheat. So in an American study by Friedman, they found a mean increase of 0.7 degrees centigrade. These are in people sitting quietly in a quiet lab, no dancing, no exercise. Um, in laboratory animals, they've measured brain temperature in parallel with body temperature, and they found the brain and the body increase in parallel. So the hypothesis is the increasing body temperature of humans is paralleled by their increasing brain temperature, which obviously isn't good for the brain. We found lots of variable effects. We've studied this in a number of studies of dance clubbers, 
And we found mild effects in some people, strong effects in the others. Um, and this led me to write a paper in 2004 of why is MDMA so strongly associated with raves? And I did a long paper on this. And what I came up with as a hypothesis was that the, the brain at raves and dances is going to overheat more. Therefore, people dance more in order to heat up their brains. Why are they heating up their brains to get more of a drug effect? We know from animal studies, rat studies, that the drug is more reinforcing if you keep the rat at a higher temperature. So if you give the rat MDMA in a hot temperature, it will bar press more for the drug than if you put the rat in a cool temperature. If you put the rat in a very cold temperature, it will stop bar pressing. So it won't get reinforcement from the MDMA because its, it's brain's too cold. It's only when your brain is hot you get more of a reinforcing effect. So there's a lot of data on that, so I recommend that paper if you're interested in that particular aspect. Um, Moorefield, a PhD student in, Ameri in Australia, Adelaide University, she found with, with ravers at house parties, dance clubs, mean increase 1.1 degrees centigrade. We did a study in Swansea, mean increase of 1.2. This is a mean group increase. We got m massive variance as well. Some people don't heat up much, other people heat up quite a bit. And it's for people who overheat quite a lot, who are obviously at most of danger of acute ab reactions. So hyponatremia is another effect of MDMA. This is when you're confused, you're hot, you're thirsty, you drink too much liquid, you're still thirsty, you drink another pint, you're still thirsty, you're hot, you're bothered, you drink more liquid. This dilutes the sodium in your blood and leads to hyponatremia. So too little sodium in your blood can kill you. This caused the death of Leah Betts in the UK in 1995, which was very well publicised, and then lots of people realise the problems of that. In a recent study in Holland, they went into a rave, tested people at random, got volunteers, and what they found was 25% of the females at the raves had low levels of the sodium in their blood. 3% of the males, so it seems to be gender specific. Um, so I think you may need to look at other things like menstrual cycle, We've done previous studies on smoke, smoking, cigarette smoking, and found that in females that's related to the menstrual cycle. So I think some of the deaths in the, the females may well be menstrual cycle related and other hormonal changes. So you get two types of death. You get hyperthermia, which is overheating. That causes a number of deaths. You also get the hyponatremia. Most people these days who go to hospitals are treated rapidly by the doctors, their blood is tested rapidly, and their lives are saved. One of my colleagues in the London University published a paper a few years ago of 328 emergency admissions to hospital, which they treated rapidly, and they had one death. But this shows the number of people with these sorts of ab reactions who end up in the medical emergency systems. So it's basically not a safe drug. Most of those were saved by giving electrolytes to the blood if they had hyponatremia or rapid cooling if they were hyperthermic. I was recently a witness on a soldier's death in the UK who'd taken a lot of ecstasy, then exercised in the heat and then died of hyperthermia. And again, he'd taken lots of ecstasy in his life, taken a lot acutely as well. Cortisol. This is the key master neurohormone. Your HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary ad adrenal axis, is essential for homeostasis. The HPA axis keeps you balanced, controls your everyday well-being, mood balance, well-being in general. If you take MGMA and give it to a volunteer in a quiet laboratory, you'll get an increase in cortisol of about 150%. We studied this in dance clubbers in 2008, and we found a massive 800% increase in cortisol. I've presented this data 
neurohormonal conferences, and the people there sit their arms folded and say, that does not occur. We don't get 800% increases in cortisol. There's something wrong with the data. Well, we actually collab collaborated with a German laboratory on this, and the Germans don't get it wrong. And we checked the data, and, and it was fine. We then replicated it in the following study, which was published in Out of Order, and when again we found an 800% increase in acute cortisol two and three hours after. So if there are any people into hormonal research, this is, really is a massive increase. The cortisol we've also taken for three-month hair samples. So you can take hair from people, cut it into strips, measure the cortisol, and what we found was that the regular users who've taken a reasonable amount of ecstasy, this was more than four tablets in three months, so it wasn't actually a large amount. It was between four and ten tablets in a three-month period. They had a 400% increase in the cortisol in their hair, which indicates the high level of stress, hormonal um, dysfunction that MGMA is causing. This slide here simply illustrates the data. We had the same people on the bottom line. Um, that's it. The bottom line be there's the same people at the same club, the same group of friends off drug. This is the group of people when they'd taken their own drugs. We weren't allowed to tell them what to take, but then we measured what they'd taken, and they'd taken MDMA in this condition. They were off MDMA when they'd agreed to abstain from using recreational drugs for that weekend. They were allowed to drink alcohol or smoke cannabis, but they, weren't, they agreed not to take stimulant drugs or anything during this abstinence weekend. So it shows the 800% increase in cortisol. This is the same design, a different study, completely different subset of people, different house party, different uh, venues. This is largely based in Manchester. But again, remarkable similarity in the increase in cortisol. Sorry. We also measured mood states in the first of these studies. And what we found was that people's moods improved at the club. So we had three groups of people. The blue line were the non-users, which were normal dance clubbers. The two red lines were dance clubbers who reported they'd taken ecstasy, MGMA. And you can see that their moods had improved at the club. The P level was 0 0.10. So it's not actually a significant mood increase. And the reason for that is they're extremely happy, but so are the non-users. If you look at midweek, the non-users are more or less where they were. But now we've got very significant sadness. So when I give this slide to my university students, I say, if you want to be sad, take ecstasy. I can guarantee your average mood over that week will be worse than if you haven't taken it. Because you've, you're on MDMA, and for four, five, six, seven, eight hours, you're very happy, euphoric, sociable, friendly, etc., etc. This period lasts one, two, three days. It's highly variable. But in general, people report low energy, low interest, low motivation, unsociability, etc., etc. So what are the effects when you take it regularly? There's this notion of serotonergic neurotoxicity, which has been widely debated. And George Ricourt, back in 2000, said that the animal literature was consistent. You've got a loss of serotonin in the animal brain. And were humans also susceptible to this? Lisa Befrenemann, based in Holland, did a series of studies, and she said that every study using heavy users found reduced density of serotonin receptors. Then Kish, based in Toronto, Canada, did what I think is the gold standard study. I don't think it's been bettered yet. Massive study really expensive, they measured just about everything you can imagine, including the kitchen sink, and they compared moderate ecstasy users of 50 controls, and they found serotonin transporter binding reduced in all regions of the cerebral cortex. So the whole of your brain is impaired if you're a regular serotonin user. You've got reduced cert in every single brain area 
throughout the, throughout the brain. And these are drug-free people. It's simply reflecting their use of drug. They also found that the degree of deficit correlated with amount you'd taken in the past. It also correlated with the extent of your memory deficits, which we'll see in a minute. Um, there's great debate about the animal people as to what is the notion of these changes in the brain. Is it true damage to the brain or is it some other factor? But most of you say it certainly causes serotonergic dysfunction. So what's serotonin doing? Why is it important? I love this quote. It's taken from non-psychopharmacology people, simply people who are experts on serotonin. And serotonin is one of the most ancient of the neurotransmitter systems in the brain. It's one of the most developed. It goes throughout the whole of the brain, and it's very primitive. So it affects nearly everything. Serotonin is an, enig an enigma. It is involved in everything. So whatever you do, cognitive function, breathing, eating, whatever, serotonin influences it. But serotonin is not in control of any of those. It's a modulator. It affects it. So you don't get gross damage to areas. What you get is partial damage. Nearly all your brain functions are partially damaged by being an MDMA user. But you don't get any purely gross, complete inabilities. So it's affected in all these things. Sleep, aggression, sex, pain, mood, heart, breathing, eating, psychomotor, memory, psychiatric disorders, etc., etc. I did a big review of this, published a few years ago, where I talked about this. So the next few slides are all based upon this paper I published a few years ago. Memory deficits. This is well recognized. It's the most thoroughly studied area of research. Kish found that the serotonin loss positively correlated with your poor memory performance score, positive correlation between the two. The first studies by Crystal et al., we did the second study in 96, Morgan, Verkus, etc. There's now lots of studies, 70 plus studies, probably over 100 now. So you get significant deficits in all the main brain areas. This has been found in meta-analyses by Rogers. One of the most sensitive areas of memory is prospective memory. If I arrange to meet you at 5 o'clock and forget to turn up, that's prospective memory. Because it's memory, it's hippocampal, it's also cognitive frontal cortex planning. I need to plan my memory, so prospective memory is more sensitive of the damaging effects of MDMA than retrospective recall, memory for past events. There's every study I've ever seen published has shown deficits in prospective memory, or PM, in ecstasy users. I'll just show one slide for these. This is a recent study we did with the cortisol levels. It's a large study. I think we had 101 subjects in this. We had controls. Recent light users have taken less than four tablets in the previous three months. That recent heavy have taken more than four tablets in the past three months. And what you find is that immediate recall is not impaired. And this generally isn't impaired. You can re recall things immediately, no problem. Probably because it doesn't involve memory storage. Delayed recall total words, you've got reduction in words. Prospective memory questionnaire, this is people reporting problems. Again, more problems reported. Um, retrospective memory, more problems reported. So you can see that this is a fairly typical finding. Ecstasy users report poorer memory. Higher cognition. Study after study, we found that MDMA users are fine at simple tasks. You can do ordinary tasks, simple reaction time, etc., etc. You're not a problem with that. If it's simple and easy, you can do it. However, if you ask to do something more complicated, you show impairments. So problem solving was impaired. Complex problem solving by Fisk, based in Lancashire in UK. Una McCann found in the States, Johns Hopkins, she found people could do tasks when they're given a loan, but if you gave them a dual task, you have to do two things at once, you then get impairments. So as soon as you're stressing the brain, you get 
poor for performance. Kathy Montgomery at John Moores University, she gave a VR task, virtual reality, modelled around the day of an office worker, a very good test, and she found deficits. So people were poorer at organising their lives. Um, vision. One of the most distal axon projections are from the Raphae nucleus in the core of the brain right over the brain to the occipital cortex of the back of the brain. These axons are very long, delicate, easily destroyed, so your visual area has less serotonin. Again, if you give people simple visual tasks, they're not impaired. Once you give them complex tasks, oh, sorry, complex tasks, yeah, complex tasks, you get an impairment. And again, there's several reports here. Um, again, this quote here from White, based in Australia, Canberra University, consistent neuro neurotoxicity in the occipital load. But again, the tasks need to be complex to show these deficits. When the Kish paper was published, my eyes lit up because one of the areas he showed was deficit was the insular cortex. Now, this is a tiny area of the brain between the temporal lobe and the, the frontal lobes. It's only got a few billion neurons, but it's, it's very small in brain terms. Because the insular cortex is involved in some of the highest aspects of cog cognition, particularly cognitive awareness and thermal awareness. Why was I interested? Because 10 years earlier, we published a paper saying that many ecstasy users seem to be impaired in conscious awareness. We were finding lots of deficits in people, and about half of people are saying, no, I'm fine. Have you got memory problems? No. We test them on our lab, and we found they did have memory problems. So their cognitive awareness seemed to be impaired. We wrote about that in 2000. Thermal awareness. Some people said, yes, I'm getting over hot. And that seemed to be associated with them getting over hot. Other people said, no, I'm fine. But they were, weren't overheating. We had people who, in our lab studies, weren't showing thermal changes, but they felt hot. So we were getting this dissociation between awareness of heat and the actual objective data. Um, so the next two slides shows the cognitive performance on a couple of tests between controls and those people that reported that they had problems and those people that said they hadn't got problems. So you can see there that both groups had problems. Some of them said they had problems, others didn't. When we looked at this data in another way, we found it simply a function of lifetime dosage. The controls, light users, medium users, heavy users. So it's simply a function of how much MDMA you take in your life, the degree of deficit you had. And the awareness seemed to be separate from that. We've also done some psychophysiological studies using what's called evoked brain potentials. Um, and in the study I'm going to show you a slide, um, we compared drug-free ecstasy users with cannabis smokers and alcohol drinkers as controls on a word recognition task. With the familiarity, which is a very simple measure, we didn't get a deficit. But with recollection, which is a memory, we did get a deficit. So this is the 108 degree channel um, hat you wear for this. Now, if we look at familiarity on this side, We've got the three groups, and you can see the brain form are almost identical. There's no difference between that. And that's for familiarity. If we look at these slides here, the blue and the black, which are the controls and the cannabis users, almost identical. But the ecstasy and cannabis user were significantly impaired. And again, we've got a nice significant deficit there. And again, there's this is one of our studies, there are probably 20, 30, 40 studies worldwide showing ERP deficits in ecstasy users, so we've widely replicated. Other deficits. Una McCann, based in the States, reported sleep disturbances. She also reported sleep apnea, now, which is normally a disease of middle-aged men who are overweight, who sort of snore and wake up with a start, etc. So it's reduced oxygen 
to, to the lung. So it's quite a dangerous medical disorder. And Una McCann discovered this when she wasn't looking for it. She was doing a, a breathing study with some hospital doctors. And they said, well, why are you surprised? Breathing is under the control of serotonin, which she didn't know, although she's an MGMA expert. And so she found this sleep apnea um, and did, did an important report on that. Immunocompetence. Your white blood cells are rather important for, for dealing with infections. These are also adversely affected by MDMA. MDMA users have increased oxidative stress, they have damage to the white blood cells. So you, MDMA re users report greater susceptibility to coughs and colds, also greater longer recovery periods. Apoptosis, this is cell death. MDMA has been tested as an anti-cancer drug. Why? It can damage human cells. They found it's not very good because it's also psychoactive, but they're still looking at MDMA-like analogs because it has the ability to, to target human cells and they want to try and get it to target the cancer cells. So this is an area um, only discovered by chance, talking to some medics, etc. Um, but it does show that MDMA is a powerful drug and it can damage human cells. We've also found recently some movement problems in some ecstasy users. And again, this fits in with the previous slide of methamphetamine users, which are well known to be associated with movement problems. So that's quite a new area which needs more research. This, shows the, this slide shows the effect of lifetime dosage. So if you look at depression, a third of novice users reported that. That is up to two-thirds in the heavy users. Mood fluctuation, a third, up to 80%. Anxiety, we've got a similar increase in all these things. Uh, tremors, twitches, etc., psychomotor problems. Infections, 5%, 9%, up to 35%. So the heavy users are reporting more problems. We were sponsored by NIDA several years ago to look at the effects of MDMA in pregnant women. This is our most difficult study. And I always put up the fact that it, we got funding for $2.6 million, because that outgoes my other funding by a factor of about 100 or something. So I'm very proud of that. Anyway, the study took a long time to do. It's a very difficult study to undertake. We recruited 96 women who were in the early stage of pregnancy, and most of them were, were, were drug users, recreational drug users. And 28 were using ecstasy during pregnancy. 12 of those had taken several lots of ecstasy during pregnancy. The highest we had was a woman who went to Amsterdam, took eight tablets on an evening and weekend when she was in the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, others, we split into two groups of 12 heavy users, 16 light users. We followed up the mothers and children for a long period of time, so it's a very difficult study. And basically, we found the children suffered as a result. You might not say that's all that surprising, but we've now got hard, hard empirical data. The psychomotor development was significantly impaired. Four months, 12 months now confirmed recently, our most recent paper at 18 months. So it's, it's not, not a good drug for the fetus. Psychiatric aspects, I don't know how much time I've got. Um, sorry, 10 minutes. Right, I'll flick through these. I think I've probably got two slides. The first study of psychiatric aspects were published um, soon after it became introduced. These were case studies. The three areas were acute psychosis, which again fits in with methamphet, depression due to the post-rebound mood problems, panic attacks also. One of my PhD students did a, a review of the case studies, and what she found was that many of the people had pre-morbid histories, about 33%, but that meant 66% didn't. So 66% of the people who had psychiatric breakdowns didn't have a known pre-morbid factor. Um, she also found that there's a link between taking up the drug and also, when people quit the drug, their psychiatric status improved. We did a large study based in uh, Manchester, London, and Italy, 
where we gave the SCL90, which is a standardized psychiatric score, to um, was over 700 people. We had six drug groups, non-users, alcohol, cannabis, light polydrug, light ecstasy, heavy MDMA. And basically, we found the more drugs you took, the worse the psychiatric outcome. Um, so this is anxiety. You can see that as you go up the um, scale from non-drug use, the problems increase. Um, lots of studies have shown an association between MDMA and adverse outcomes. Lynn Singer, based in the States, associated with anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, etc. Next study by Sumnall, Beck anxiety subscales. Next study, depression, ADHD. Um, Reed from the States did an interesting paper called Hug Drug or Fug Drug. They found more aggression, and we've seen this in a number of cases. And basically, it tends to be aggression off drug. So people feel okay on drug, afterwards they feel angry, aggressed, irritable, short-tempered, etc. Briere et al., big Canadian study, they found that those youngsters, these are 16-year-olds, etc., who took a MDMA a year later, significantly more depressed, etc. So there's lots of data showing adverse psychiatric outcome. As I mentioned at the start of the talk, other drug use is also very prevalent. And we spent a lot of trying to, trying to un unravel the effects of different drugs, and that's not easy. So we've shown that cannabis has interesting co-dynamics. Again, I wrote another paper on this in 2007. Cannabis is an interesting drug because ca cannabis cools down the brain. And many ecstasy users take cannabis when they're coming down off the drug. So I think MDMA heats up the brain, cannabis cools it down. MDMA causes oxidative stress. You get free radicals. That damages the brain, premature aging, et cetera, et cetera, cognitive damage. Cannabis is one of the most powerful antioxidants we know. So again, cannabis has oxidant protective properties when people are coming down off MDMA. Um, it's also cannabis is sedative, MDMA is stimulant. So you've got these three key ways in which they dynamically feed back off each other. Um, Dalman did an important paper where he reported that cannabis was more damaging than MDMA, widely reported in the press. They like these stories. But if you look at it, the MDMA usage in this group was almost minimal, whereas they are all heavy cannabis users. So it really wasn't surprising that cannabis was the main, main drug. Cocaine and amphetamine, they're often used as co-drugs. It's really quite difficult to tease out the different effects of these drugs, but we, we try to do it statistically. We also did a, an analysis of nicotine. Now, nicotine is a powerful CNS stimulant, and we found that nicotine was one of the worst co-drugs, and this is rarely assessed in studies. But I've done lots of research, published in the 1980s and 1990s, into the damaging effects of nicotine and the way it, in, it increases stress, increases depression. And we now think that nicotine is probably one of the worst of the co-drugs for, for MDMA, but again, it needs a lot more research for that. Nicotine makes you moody. Your moods go up and down if you're a smoker. You don't gain anything from nicotine, you simply suffer without it, which is why it's so addictive. Again, I've, I've written lots, lots of research on that. We can discuss that later, I guess. <laughs> What are the gains of quitting? Again, several studies reported gains of quitting. Susan Ver Hayden, 70% of former users reported improved mental health after quitting MDMA. John Turner, my colleague at East London, found that the MDMA using mothers were more depressed on drug. They then quit the drug once they found out that they were pregnant, etc. But by that, it's too late for the fetus. But 18 months later, they, depression was back to that of the non-users. So it was higher when they're using MDMA. It improved when they quit. Um, so what's an overview of the functional problems? It's a really interesting drug, fascinating drug, because the effects are subtle and widespread. You don't get MDMA users who can't function, unlike opiate users, methamphet, crack cocaine. MDMA users can function in society. It's just they're not very good. 
they're poor at everything. They can do a simple cognitive task, and that's about it. Their eating's impaired, their thermal control is impaired, their depression is increased, their psychiatric status susceptibility, susceptibility to coughs and colds is worse, etc. So you look at everything, sleeping at night is impaired. About 70% of regular ecstasy users report impaired sleep. Um, so it's, they're very impaired in lots of different things. Um, Again, I've got a slide there of possible reasons. It's the HPA axis. This is one of my favorite areas. It's the cortisol hormones associated with that um, are impaired, as well as serotonin. 90% of the research talks about serotonin. I think hormones are also important. If we look historically, cocaine, when it was introduced, was seen as safe. It took about 30, 40 years for people to realize it was, it was problematic. Um, Sigmund Freud was very instrumental in looking at this. He found cocaine addiction, etc., etc. He himself was a user for a while, but he quit when one of his friends died. He'd introduced it, Fleischel Morris, to, to using cocaine. He then died two months, two, two years later. So Freud then stopped taking it. He couldn't stop taking nicotine, though. That, that killed him a number of years later. Amphetamine, introduced from the 1920s and 1930s, sold as a tonic, a pick-me-up. Feeling low in spirits, take amphetamine. You could buy it in drugstores, etc. Again, it took 20 years or so to be, for its addictiveness to be um, recognized. MDMA introduced from the 1980s. In the 1990s, we thought the deficits were limited to a bit of memory problems, a bit of depression, and it was seen as relatively safe. This is where David Nutt still is. He doesn't know the literature. He still thinks MDMA is a relatively safe drug and it just has a bit of effect on your memory and might make a few susceptible people depressed, and that's it. But research in the past 10, 15 years has shown a vast array of deficits. All areas of the brain seem to be impaired, but they're impaired in, in, in subtle, subtle ways. Anyway, I'll finish there. This is collaborative work. These are my main collaborators on this slide. Um, I think that's it. I'll finish there. All right, okay.